Hey everybody, welcome to Crosswinds Church, where we're all about this vision of growing closer to God and going into our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there's a place here for you. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming sermons, as well as view previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the service. I just previewed that. I uh, hadn't seen it before. So uh, thanks, thanks, Ryan. Ryan Wolf puts those together for us. So uh, thank him next to, yeah. And, and he's listening. He's out there somewhere listening. That's a couple of guys, actually a whole group of guys decided to go on a, a weekend hunting trip. They were going to go hunting for deer. And uh, they decided they would split off in twos and go off uh, and hunt. And uh, at the end of the day, this one guy comes back, and he's struggling as he's coming back. He's got an eight-point buck on his back. And as he comes in, he <laughs> drops the things down, and the other guys are saying, hey, uh, where's Harry? And he goes, oh, uh, Harry, uh, he had some kind of a stroke or something. He's about two miles up the trail. And they're like, what do you mean? You, you, you carried a, this, this deer back on your back, and you left Harry sitting out there on the trail? And he goes, well, I didn't think anybody would steal Harry. Now, I share that because I wonder when I hear something like that, I wonder how Harry must have felt, you know, I mean, kind of abandoned, uh, depressed, left alone, cold, you know, I mean, that, and, and I think that that's kind of a feeling that we all have at various times. Hopefully you weren't left behind while having a stroke on a trail, but we've all had those kinds of feelings. And maybe we think that, you know, if I just knew more, if I was just more, uh, you know, more, more incapable of, of accessing the great truths of the word, then I wouldn't have those feelings, right? I mean, guys like, like Billy Graham and, and people like that, they don't, they don't struggle like that. Well, I kind of beg to differ. This week I was uh, reading from John Henry Jowett. And John Henry Jowett, who was a, many considered to be the greatest preacher in the English-speaking world, wrote bestsellers, preached to thousands of people. He said this, you seem to imagine that I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> By no means, he said, oftentimes everything in my life appears to be murky. Now, maybe you don't know Jowett, but you might have heard the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon, often called the Prince of Preachers. Surely he didn't experience depression or down times. Well, again, here's what he said. I am the subject of depressions of spirit, so fearful that I hope none of you ever gets to such extremes of wretchedness as I go to. And so discouragement is a, a universal experience, is it not? Discouragement and stress and, and, and being downcast, it happens to all of us. I, I think of that poem uh, by Longfellow where we come up with the line, into each life some rain must fall. And we almost blithely say that, right? Well, you know, yeah, life has its ups and downs. Into each life some rain must fall. And I thought of a phrase like that in light of uh, Hurricane Dorian this past week. Here's what it looked like in the Bahamas. Yeah, into some life some rain must fall. Uh, but, and, and sometimes I think some of us could say, yeah, I've had uh, discouragements. I've had struggles and trials that are Hurricane Dorian sized. And so don't tell me about a little rain, the little showers in my life. Well, today we come back to this study of being the church 
in the 21st century. The idea of the fact that we are in a church building, but when we talk about building the church and being the church, uh, we're not talking about the building itself. We're talking about us. We're talking about the people in the church, the body of Christ, of which Christ is the head. And as Peter said, we are all stones in that great building. We are the church. And so we're learning how it, what it means to be the church here in the 21st century. And we're using a 2,000-year-old letter to a particularly troubled church in the first century. And some people might wonder, you know, how, how applicable is that? How much can we really derive from a, a church that old, from a letter that, that, that is that old? People have said that. Let me remind you of the, the church and, more importantly, the community that this church resided in. It was in the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth would arguably be considered the sin center of the Roman world. It was a prosperous port city. There were about a half a million people that lived there. They had visitors from worldwide. They had influences from all the world. The trade routes went through the city of Corinth. And so it was extremely affluent. In addition to that, they had the temple of Aphrodite, the temple uh, uh, to the goddess of love. And one aspect of their worship, quote unquote, was to go visit a temple prostitute, of which it is said there were upwards of a thousand of them plying their trade there in the city of Corinth. In fact, in the ancient world, to Corinthianize meant to actually experience sin to its greatest limits. Plato termed prostitutes, he called prostitutes Corinthian girls. There was a proverb popular in those days that went like this, not for every man is the voyage to Corinth. Not every man could take it, nor does every man uh, probably want to deal with that. I would think that if we would have a proverb today for the city of Corinth, it would probably be something along the lines of what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth because it is a good example of the a first century Las Vegas only on steroids. Now, when you think of that and you realize that's who he's writing to, then you can probably imagine that, yeah, maybe they do have something to share with us. Maybe there is some things, some connections that we can make with a place like that. Let me give you a little bit of background on Paul and his relationship with this city and in particular with this church. Uh, we, he started his, during his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul spent about a year and a half in the city of Corinth. And it was during that time that he established the church, that he got started with them, started teaching them, started building them up. And then on his second journey, he wrote his first letter to them, Interestingly enough, probably is not 1 Corinthians. He, as we read the letters, we find that there were other letters that he wrote to them. And so the first letter he wrote to them was probably not 1 Corinthians because he references that letter in 1 Corinthians. And then later he wrote his second letter to them, which we know as 1 Corinthians, which is what we went through last year. Soon after that, he made what's become known as his painful visit, quote unquote, his painful visit where he had to address some sin issues in the church. He was uh, being challenged in his authority, which we're going to see some of that even still today. And he had to probably enact some church discipline. So that was his painful visit. After that, he wrote what became known as his severe letter, quote unquote. Now, some scholars think that 1 Corinthians is the severe letter. Many of them, me included, don't really think that 1 Corinthians is severe enough considering how, this, how it sounds that this letter must have received, uh, how they must have received that letter. He was supposed to visit again. Uh, situations occurred in his life. There was, if we're going to see today, all kinds of stuff happened in Paul's life that prevented him from coming. And instead, he wrote them another letter, possibly his fourth letter, which we call 2 Corinthians. Is that all clear for everybody? All right, good. I'm glad you got all that. Let's go on now. <laughs> Notice I don't wait for an answer. Today, we come to 2 Corinthians, possibly his fourth letter to them. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As always, I want to encourage you to take out the note sheets you have in your bulletin and, and take some notes today. There'll be some things I'll encourage you to write down. Um, also, on the back of those sheets starting today, because our life group's 
begin, there are a series of questions that will form the basis for our life groups this week. And uh, hopefully you're, you're planning to be a part of a life group. If not, feel free to use those questions in your own uh, study and debrief of the passage. If you're uh, with us today streaming online, you can also access the notes and the uh, questions on our church app as well. This is the Apostle Paul's most personal letter. In fact, I was telling the prayer group this morning that one of the things we pastors do, at least I can't speak for all, but for me, as a preacher, sometimes I go to the Pauline letters because in one sense they can be a little bit easier to preach from because the Apostle Paul is so systematic. I mean, the the outlines almost write themselves when you're looking at most all of Paul's letters. The exception being 2 Corinthians, which I found out this week. (laughs) 2 Corinthians is an intensely personal letter. And I guess that when even the Apostle Paul is getting personal and is experiencing stresses and difficulties, he doesn't necessarily, I guess, work out so much his outline or, or become across as systematic. Sometimes he's just pouring out his heart. And it makes it a real challenge. However, it is, uh, it's good, even for us preachers now and then, to study to show ourselves approved, a, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, but correctly handles the Word of God. So I look forward to the challenge, and I'm excited about what God has in store for us. So let's begin as we open this letter. The Apostle Paul I see today, because in spite of his lack of an outline, I still came up with one. So what I see today is he begins with the idea of letting them know just who it is that you're serving. Who is it that you're serving? The Apostle, uh, verse one begins this way. Paul, I might stop right there and just mention it's kind of nice in the ancient world Uh, When you got a letter from somebody, you didn't have to do like we do today, where you go to the end of the letter and find out who wrote it, so you decide whether you want to read it or not. No, no. (laughs) They actually put their name right up front, so you had that context right right at the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Paul is writing under the authority of an apostle, And he's letting them know that, which is an interesting thing when you think about it, because he knew these people. He had lived with them. They were were intimately involved. And and in fact, he comments on that at various times in 1 and 2 Corinthians. So it's interesting that he would give these credentials like this. Uh, It's almost like, you know, if I go to my daughter, Wendy, or I, I write my daughter, Wendy, a letter, I don't say, Wendy, it's your dad, William, the pastor of the church, the reverend. Here's my credentials. Here's my, my content, you know, my, my transcripts from my, my, my study. You know, I don't have to do all that. She knows me, and I don't have to give her all of that. And in a sense, that's kind of what Paul had with the Corinthians. However, as we're going to see, it is important in this case, being the, what he's going to be writing about, that he sets out his authority as an apostle. Apostle literally means one sent forth. So in one sense, uh, we are all apostles. We tend to look at the, the gift of apostleship today as being something that missionaries would have. Uh, however, in the first century, you had the apostles. You had the office of apostle. You had the 12 apostles. And and in order to be an apostle, as Paul is talking about here, you had to be someone who was called personally by Jesus. You had to see his work. You had to be there while he was performing his miracles. In other words, you lived with him. You interacted with him. And so those were the 12 apostles. Now, some would say, well, wait a minute. Paul wasn't in that group. If anything, Paul was opposing that group. He He was a persecutor of the church early on. Yes, you're right. Which is why Paul says that, I am an apostle by the will of God. Paul, interestingly enough, is an apostle almost against his own will, although he desired to to be close to God. And in fact, his persecution was his misguided efforts to obey God at the time. But on that way to Damascus, when he gets knocked to the ground and he loses his eyesight, it was Jesus who called him into ministry. And many believe that he actually was was, uh, actually discipled by Jesus himself. And so Paul is a special apostle, and he'll often say that, as he does here, an apostle by the will of God. It's important, guys, that 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 we catch on to that, that what we do here is by the will of God. It's kind of almost like he's telling the false apostles, you know what, if you have a, an issue with me being an apostle, and they did, and, and we'll be talking more about that in the next coming weeks, if you have a problem with me being an apostle, then take it up with God. 
okay? Because God is the one that made me an apostle. It reminds me of how uh, now that we're, we're basically going worldwide with our messages, and I get emails from people that have issues with things that I have said, for instance, about particular lifestyles, maybe, and they'll have questions about that. And, and consistently what people will say to me or even write to me is they'll say, so you're saying that what I'm doing is wrong. And I say to them every time, and I would advise you to do the same, no, I'm not saying it. The word of God says it. Let me share with you where. Because really, it doesn't matter what Willie thinks or what my opinion is. What matters, and hopefully matters to anybody that's watching a church service, is what does the word of God say? And so that's what the apostle Paul is doing here. He's appealing back to God's will. I didn't just decide to be an apostle. He'd be crazy to when you look at, at what it got him. And so he's, he is here by the will of God, along with Timothy, Timothy, who we've been looking at all summer long, his protege, he continues to encourage Timothy as we've been seeing that, how Timothy, this young pastor who was uh, probably a bit timid, probably uh, sickly, and so he continues to encourage him by putting him right up there with him. He continues on in verse one, so that's who it's from, who to, verse one continues, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Notice it's the church of God. It's not the church of Corinth. It's not the, the, it, it's not, uh, the church of, uh, of Moreno Valley. It's not the church. It's the church of God. It's God's church. And we need to remember things like that. It, it seems like a little thing, but it's vastly important. When, when the elders of your church or the staff or the leadership of the church, when we make decisions, we're making decisions not based upon what we think or what I would like to see happen, we are constantly trying to discern what does God want to have happen here? What does he want to accomplish in this place? And hopefully lining up our decisions with what he's already given to us. With all the saints, verse 1 continues, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, so all the saints, now <laughs> I've had people say to me, oh, well, then that, that leaves me out. The last thing I am is a saint. Okay, well, I've got good news for you. You're not a saint by virtue of your behavior. Whew, that's good. And that's not what he's talking about here. You're a saint by virtue of the fact that God chose you. You are set apart by God. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are a saint. You've been chosen by him. You've been made holy by him. And so what he's saying here is this letter was not just for the Corinthians. This letter was meant to be circulated throughout all of the region right down to us today. So it is a letter for us, written personally for us. Verse 2, standard greeting from Paul. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a standard greeting, if you will, from not only from Paul, it was actually a standard greeting in the first century to say grace and peace. But maybe as Christians, we look at it a little bit differently. Grace, you see, one way to look at that, there's a number of ways, but one way to look at that succinctly would be that grace is the love of God in action. Grace is what God did. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Jesus Christ is the very personification of grace. And then what is peace? Peace is the result of that reality, the love of God in action in our lives, at work in us. Now, interestingly enough, to the Jews, that when they talked about peace, the word is shalom. You've probably heard that word. Now, that word shalom doesn't talk about an absence of conflict. I mean, if any group did not have an absence of conflict, I know that's a double negative, but I think you get what I mean. If any group had conflict, it was the Jews. And yet they would constantly pronounce shalom. It was a standard greeting. What it really is talking about is an inner tranquility, an inner wholeness, an inner peace within them. And hopefully Paul is saying that this would be a reality in your life, even though, as we're going to see, I know that the reality is otherwise. Your, your external situation is rough. But internally, I want you to experience that peace that, that, that passes understanding. Even though he's being attacked by uh, many people, as we're going to see, he doesn't respond in kind. He says to them, grace and peace. He's, he, he's demonstrating, he's, he's modeling for us the idea of being a peacemaker. And now he reminds them just who it is that they're serving. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. 
The blessed be here could be also be praise be. He's praising God. Praise be to God who sent his son Jesus to die on that cross for our salvation. And just to be clear, uh, let me tell you also, he is the father of mercies. And what is mercy? Mercy is that thing that you, that you cry out for when you have no other recourse. If, if they've got you dead to rights and you're standing before the judge in court, the only thing, if, if they know you did it and you know you did it, the only thing you really have left is mercy. <laughs> you, you throw yourself on the mercy of the court. And the Apostle Paul is thanking God for that mercy because it's, it, it literally means to not get what you deserve. And the Apostle Paul knew that he didn't get what he deserved and that they, uh, that they the Corinthians, don't get what they deserve. I love Westerns, Western movies. And uh, this month at the theater, they're having a, 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 they're calling it Western Wednesdays. And, um, and this week, this past uh, Wednesday, they showed the movie Unforgiven. If you've ever seen the, the Clint Eastwood film Unforgiven, it's about a, a, an aging gunfighter played by Eastwood and a, and a young up and coming gunfighter who's, you know, wants to learn how to be a gunfighter like Eastwood. And they're, they, they've gone off to this, this town of Biz, Big Whiskey, um, Wyoming or something like that. And they're going to they're gonna kill this guy, this guy who, who uh, treated a woman real bad. And so, you know, there's some men that just need to be killed, right? And so he deserves killing. And, and so afterwards, and this scene that I'm picturing here is after it's happened and they're waiting for the gal to bring them their, their money for the job that they did. And the young guy is, is sitting down and he's drinking and he's trying to reconcile in his mind. And he's saying, you know, it, it is, it, and he's having second thoughts. He ultimately gives up the life, fortunately for him. But he's, he's, he's reminiscing over and he's saying, man, and he's crying. And he's saying, it's, it's, it's terrible. You know, he's, he's not, he, he was there and now he's not. And, and Eastwood says this great line. He says, yeah, it's a heck of a thing to kill a man. You take away everything he has and everything he's going to have. And then the young guy says, <laughs> I'm glad you find that funny. <laughs> Think about that next time you kill a man, right? <laughs> but then the young guy says, yeah, well, he had it coming. And Eastwood says, I'll give you the best line in the movie. He goes, we all have it coming, kid. And I thought, wow, that's a real great theological exposition of the gospel. We all have it coming, do we not? Is that not what the Bible says? We all have it coming. And the thing is, God's mercy dictates that we don't have to get it because Jesus Christ gave it to us, did it for us. The Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, the, and because of that, the wages of sin is death. And so we've all got it coming. We're all going to die. But, that verse continues, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why Jesus Christ, when he came to earth and lived that perfect life, the only one in all of history that didn't have it coming and yet decided to die, not for his sins, but for our sins. And because of that, we can experience eternal life because he died in our place. You say, how do we do that? We call it the ABCs. A means to admit for, to yourself and to others, first off, yeah, I'm one of the all that has, that has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not perfect. I am a sinner. I am separated from God, and, and, and I deserve to die. I, 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 I owe that price. And then secondly, the B is to believe that Jesus Christ paid that price, in fact, is the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins. And he paid that price. And the Bible says, if you believe that, you will experience salvation. And then finally, the C simply says to choose, to make a choice, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and experience his salvation. And if you've done that, then amen, be reminded of that. If you haven't done that, then what are you waiting for? You stand condemned. You stand as one that, that deserves it. You stand as one that, that's going to get what's coming to you because you deserve to get it. And yet God, as we talk about here, this, this idea of God being the God of all comfort. And, and some people will say, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's real because I, I'm just not too comfortable. I look around this room and I know a lot of the situations represented by many of you. 
And I see a lot of discomfort and a lot of struggles and trials that you're going through. But you need to understand that when we talk about God being the God of all comfort, we're not necessarily talking about ease and relaxation. Rather, we're talking about encouragement. We're talking about comfort as a verb. You see, we, we can be in comfort or we can give comfort. And that's who God is. He's the God of comfort. Now, obviously, he doesn't rescue us from every discomfort. Instead, what does he do? He gives us the tools we need in order to endure through that comfort for his purposes. And we're going to see those this morning. I've termed it this morning an uncomfortable comfort. It's, it's one of those paradoxes that you see throughout Scripture, right? Right? I mean, we talk about how in order to live, you got to die. In order, if you want to be a leader, you got to be a servant of everybody. And here's another one. In order to experience God's comfort, and in fact, God's comfort is in mercy and grace, they are more powerfully experienced at times of distress. They're more powerfully experienced at the worst of times. That's when you really realize, wow, God is the God of mercy. When you're in those dark times, we are called to be a light in darkness. Therefore, the more, we, the more darkness we're in, the brighter our light will shine. Frankly, if, I wouldn't hardly notice, I think, if things were just always good the way I would want it. So that's who it is that we are serving. And, and Paul goes on now to tell us what God wants to do through you, even in that lack of comfort or that uncomfortable discomfort. Verse 4, he says, this God of all comfort, verse 4, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that, here's the reason, we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So while difficulties and trials and discouragements, they're never easy by definition, at least for, as Christians, we can know that trials and troubles and difficulties have a purpose. Once you get through it, you can be there for others. So many trials in life are, are things, you know, as a preacher, as a teacher, uh, and if you've been around any number of years, you'll know that, that a lot of what I teach and what I preach is mistakes I made. It's struggles that I went through. It's, it's, it's stuff that I had to endure, and, and I learned the hard way, and yet God is using that. At the very least, I would say this, it changes my perspective. Because what happens when we go through hard times and difficulties? What's the, the natural reaction is to start focusing on yourself. Well, why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? Why is God doing this to me? Whereas if we take what Paul is telling us here to heart, we start to turn our attention rather on ourselves. I mean, it's still going to be there, but there's a certain amount that's now going to go out where we can actually say, what does God want to do in this? And it's been an encouraging week. One of the things that, that I, uh, I kind of prepare myself for now, because they say the, the life of a preacher is the life of his preaching. And so I, I almost expect that, that at least the week before, if not more, there's going to be experiences that I go through. And this has been, uh, there's been a couple of difficult situations that I've had this week, some uh, criticisms and things that I've had to, to deal with this week. And rather than just, because I'm studying this, rather than just take it as, well, I don't deserve that. Why are they treating me like that? Why is this, a, you know, rather than do that, there's, I, I did feel a certain amount of that, I'll be honest. But there was a part of me that was saying, you know what, but God knows that. And, he, and he's working in my life, and he loves me, and, and obviously he's building me up. He's preparing me for something that he has in store for me, even in the struggle that I'm experiencing right now. Look at verse 5. For, the, for just as the sufferings of Christ, I, I just stop right there and think as I was reading this the first time this week, just that, well, not the very first time, but the first time recently, uh, but you know, just as the sufferings of Christ, and I thought to myself, what are you always saying, Willie? You want to be just like Jesus. <laughs> and then, you know, go look at the life of Jesus sometime and think, really, is that what you signed up for? Yeah, yeah. You know, what, what did he say? If you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and, and follow me. Yeah. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I, I have abundant sufferings. <laughs> okay. Uh, so also, though, he doesn't end there. So also our comfort is abundant through Christ. 
You see, suffering is just one aspect of our relationship with Christ. In fact, he says we will, all, we will have abundant suffering, but we'll also receive through that abundant comfort, God's uncomfortable comfort, if you will. I got to tell you, Paul has a radically different view of suffering. For him, it's almost not a negative at all. And I only say almost because he's human, but uh, you know, I could almost say he's, he, he has no negative view of suffering. But in this, what he's getting at here is it's God's way of allowing us to become more like Jesus. And that's who Jesus was, i.e., the suffering servant. Verse 6, but if we are afflicted, catch this, it is for your comfort and salvation. Now, the salvation he's talking about here is not what we just talked about, coming to know Jesus Christ. The salvation here could rather be translated sanctification. It's our ongoing growth. It's our walk with him. We're being built up and encouraged, and that's exactly what's going to happen as we're going to see this morning. Six continues, or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Now, granted, Paul here is not talking about the, the standard sufferings in life. You know, my wife burned the toast this morning. The kids just won't listen to me. Uh, the, the dog did his business on the carpet. I mean, these are not the sufferings that he's talking about here. The Apostle Paul is talking about being persecuted for identifying with Jesus Christ. He's talking about preaching the message of the gospel in a hostile environment where you are told if, if you do that, you know, we're going we're gonna to feed you lunch to the lions with you. And, and increasingly, while well, we're not getting fed lions, but you would have to admit that, that our environment is getting a bit more hostile. So there again is one more way that we can identify with that first century church. But here's the thing. Here's what he's getting at. As the Corinthians saw how, quote unquote, comfortable Paul was in suffering, they were also comforted because they realize, wow, with what he's going through, if he's comforted, then maybe what this, this Bible says or maybe what this God thing says is true. It was an uncomfortable comfort, but comfort nevertheless. Verse 7, and our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers in our sufferings, so also you are sharers in our comfort. So here are the Corinthians who were also suffering. They're, they're not all uh, bad. They're not all false teachers and all that. There's a good number of the Corinthians that were also suffering for righteousness. And Paul says, you give me hope. In fact, he goes even further. You give me firmly grounded hope. I have absolute hope in you. And what was his hope? My ministry was effective. I've, I've accomplished something. You guys, in, in the midst of this, of this wicked and perverse generation that you're living in, you're strong. God is working in you, and that gives Paul hope. You know, the strongest bonds that I think could possibly be in this life are those bonds when you are, 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 are working alongside people in, in various endeavors. I think of, of people that go to war. I mean, when you're out on the battlefield with somebody, and I've met, I've talked to a number of veterans, and they will say, my strongest relationships are those guys that I fought in Vietnam with, because I trusted my life to those guys. And when they went through that struggle together, man, they were like this, and they stayed together. And, and you know, you see, uh, I was just reading recently about uh, some of the last World War II veterans. They still get together on a yearly basis, the five or six of them that are left, you know, from some particular ship that went down in the in the Pacific. And, and, and those, these guys are lifelong friends. Uh, athletic teams, to maybe a lesser degree, have the same thing. You know, we're there for each other. We, we need each other. Missionaries are the same way. Jesus, when he sent out his, his disciples, what did he do? He sent them out in twos and threes because he knew that you don't want to be out there by yourself. You don't want to be alone. We need each other. Guys, this is a key thing when it comes to suffering. In, in 1 Corinthians, we talked about, you'll remember, spiritual gifts. And the key aspect of spiritual gifts is that God gives gifts to the church for what reason? For the building up of the body of Christ. Your spiritual gift was not meant just to make you feel good, even though it might make you feel good, yet that's not its purpose. Its primary purpose is to build up the body of Christ. You have a gift for the rest of us. And it would seem that that's the same here with suffering. You are suffering for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, being there for each other. We are not to suffer in silence, and yet we so often do, don't we? Think about this. To the degree that I can 
encourage others is the degree is the degree to which I have been encouraged or comforted myself. You see, often when we experience God's faithfulness firsthand, then we can then go out and assure others that God is faithful. We have a number of individuals, probably more than I'm even aware of, who have struggled and dealt with cancer in our church. And, and we have some now that are dealing with it right now. And I can tell you that when I share with them, when I talk with them, I've never had cancer, but when I talk with them, I can, I can pray for them, I can share scripture with them, I can hopefully encourage them with the word of God, but that's as far as I can go. When somebody who has dealt with cancer or is dealing with it and God has been faithful in their life and they have an opportunity to share in that person's life, man, the comfort and the encouragement goes up exponentially more than I could ever do because I've never been through that. I have things that I've been through that I can encourage people with that is unique to me, but that just doesn't happen to be one of them. Guys, those are the things, those are the opportunities we have to experience this uncomfortable comfort that God provides for us. That's what he wants to do through our afflictions. That's the the purpose behind many of them. But Paul has one more thing to tell them, and that is this, what God has done for you. Now, here is where Paul is going to go from the general to the personal. And I'll tell you, next week, he's going to get very personal. Next week, he's going to talk specifically about the criticism. And so that's the direction that that we're going to go in. You know, how do you, I, I know most of you don't have any critics in your life, right? Nobody ever tells you you've done anything wrong, you know, or, or has issues with the stuff you do. But for the few of us that do, you know, next week will be really good. How do you deal with your criticism? Critics. So here he goes, verse 8, for I, we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, commentators don't really know exactly what Paul is talking about here. We don't know the specific situation. We do know, however, that this wasn't just into each life a little rain must fall, right? Right? I mean, this, but the language that he's using here, this has to be a Hurricane Dorian level of discomfort that he's experiencing. Some people say that Paul was so ill, he was going to die. Others say, uh, and I referenced this in the Bible study this week, it's in Acts 19.23, you can look at it yourself, but there was a riot in the city of Ephesus as a result of what Paul was doing. Some people say that that's what he's referencing here. It might have been any number of things. The Apostle Paul later on in, in verse 11 talks about a whole bunch of stuff that happens to him in 2 Corinthians 11.24. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I've spent in the deep. I mean, he goes on and on and on. There's any number of things that the Apostle Paul could have drawn upon to make the statement that he just made about the sufferings that he had. We don't know exactly what he's talking about, but I think in a certain sense that's just as well. Because if we did know exactly what he's talking about, there'd probably be those purists that would say, well, you can't apply that to your situation unless you've been in a shipwreck or you know, something like that. So the fact that we don't know what it is makes it fairly uh, universally applicable for us. Verse 9, indeed, he said, we had, look at this phrase, the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. When Paul says this, this, this phrase, the sentence of death within himself. He's not talking about the judge handing down a sentence. He's talking about, he's saying that I felt like I was going to die. This is it. A handful of us have been at those places where we thought, this is it. I, 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 was, uh, I was a window washer for many years. I walked into a, an armed robbery in, in progress, and the guy turned around, and he pointed a gun at me, and he's shaking like this. And I thought, all right, Jesus, here I come. <laughs> I mean, this is it. I mean, you got a barrel of a gun in your face. Uh, it didn't happen. But, you know, that's what Paul is saying that he's experiencing at this point. I don't think I'm going to make it. I'm going to die. And what did it cause Paul to do? To realize that there's nothing I can do about this. I'm just going to put my entire trust in the Lord. Uh, there's, there's nothing I can do about this situation. I can't make it better on my own. And he was able, and he's put his trust in the Lord, who was able and who promised to raise the dead. <laughs> I've talked about how I'm real big on doing it myself, right? How I love YouTube and, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to pay people. Currently, I have, a, I have an RV, a used RV that I bought about a year ago, and I've been, I've been thinking about... Uh, well, not thinking about it. I need to put a new roof on the thing. And, and, and I looked at how much it costs to do that, and it's like 
way too much money for me. I mean, I, I have the money, but I don't want to spend it on that. I'll just do it myself. And, and the trouble is there's times when I do things myself and, you know, get ways into it. And I start thinking, what was I thinking? You know, and that's when I turn to the Lord. And so it's one of the reasons I've been kind of waiting on this roof thing because I, I don't want to get into a situation like that. But, yeah, I know myself. I'm probably going to give it a shot. Anyway. <laughs> But at that point, but the thing is, we trust in the Lord when we get to those places where we know uh, there's nothing I can do about this. And in doing so, he says, I find greater strength than I could ever find in my own ability. That's why it's interesting when, when Christians who literally have a, a, a diagnosis of death on them. I remember many, many years, uh, uh, a lot of you know that I'm, I'm a fan of J. Vernon McGee, uh, the Bible teacher. And, and he went like, 15, 20 years of his life with, with the diagnosis of cancer that they kept telling him, you got about another six months, another year, another... And he went for another 20 years. And he concluded, you know, many times over the, the end of his life, he concluded, he said, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I put so much trust in the Lord because there was nothing I could do about it. I mean, I had a death sentence. And so, you know, my whole, my whole point in life was, Lord, if you give me more time, I'll preach more of the word. And it, it, it enabled him to get a couple times through the entire Bible while under this death sentence. Think about it, guys. As Paul says here, God can raise the dead. He's in the dead raising business. Maybe there's some dead things in your life that you've just given up on. And that's, that's it. It's, it's done for. I think of relationships in particular and, and family relationships. Maybe there's those, those, those situations in your family or friends where you think it's just dead, it's done, that we're never, nothing's ever going to happen there. Guess what? God can raise that dead relationship. Maybe your peace or your joy is dead. God can raise that, guys. Maybe literally your marriage is on the rocks and you're just existing together. Guys, God is in the raising of the dead business. He can raise dead things. Let's take him at his word, amen? Quit trying to figure it out yourself in your own energy. I guess if there's just something I could do, realize, no, maybe there, there's nothing you can do. If there is, do it. But admit to yourself, ultimately, there's nothing I can do. Seek the Lord, trust in him, and recognize and, and praise him that he specializes in raising dead things. And to emphasize that fact, look how Paul describes the Lord. He, he says, this God who raises the dead, then verse 10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope and will yet deliver us. Now, I don't know if you caught what he did right there, but let me point it out to you. You might want to write this one down. God delivered us. That's a past event. God will deliver us. That's the present and God yet delivers us, that is the future. Man, talk about hope. And what is the hope in that? The hope is that because God has been faithful in the past, I can trust in him, I can put my faith in him for my present, and I can look forward and put my faith in him for the future. How many things in your life can you believe that about? I, I had a, Jackie and I, uh, I've had a lot of cars in my day, and, and arguably the best car I ever owned was a car given to us by Ron and Elaine Schaefer, members, they come to first service, and it kind of struck me as I was, I was sharing this illustration, and I, I looked over, and I see Ron, and I go, and Ron, you gave me this car. It was a 1968 Volvo 122, the ugliest car you could ever imagine. I mean, it was, it was red, but it was long since faded red. Uh, it was just an ugly car, but man, the thing was a tank. It never quit. It never gave up. It was, always, it was always faithful in the past. I had no doubt that if I went out and turned that key, that it would start. Or if it didn't start, I could just put a battery in it, and it would start up. And, and, I, and I projected that it would go on forever. And for all I know, it's still out there running somewhere. When I got done with it, after about 10 years, I gave it to a friend of mine. And last I heard, he was driving it still. I wish I'd never given the thing away. I mean, it's, it, it's the most faithful thing. But that's what he says about God, and that's what gives us hope. Think about something that maybe really bothered you, say, a year ago. Now, maybe it still is, but that's not the thing I'm asking you to think about. Think about something that really bothered you, that you were really struggling with, and then think, and, you know, something maybe you thought, oh, this is it, this is going to do it, this is, oh, this is, it's going to be over after this. Well, then now look at where you are today. Sometimes, and I, as I did this little experiment myself, I really had to think about some of those things. And I began to come up with stuff. Yeah, I was really 
you know, concerned about that. I was really up in arms about that. And then guess what? The Lord delivered me. The Lord was faithful. And, I, and so much so that I, I have a hard time even remembering it. But we need to remember things like that. We need to remember what God has done in the past so that it can impact our, for our present and it can give us hope and encouragement for the future. Not just move on from our current problems because God has delivered us, he is delivering us and will continue to deliver, to deliver us. It's one of the reasons that, that God prescribed that the Jews would celebrate Passover. What's he doing for them there? He's saying, remember yearly this major event where I delivered you and realize that I'm the same God that delivered you then and I'm going to deliver you from anything else. And that goes, that goes true for many of our celebrations. Obviously, Christmas and, and Easter, we think about past events, gives us encouragement for the present and the future. But also even some of our secular holidays. I think of Fourth of July or Veterans Day. I mean, we think about the, the heroics of the past and it gives us hope and encouragement that yes, we can go on from here. Those who forget the past, as George Santayana said, are destined to repeat it and we don't want to be one of those. So those are some of the things that God has done for Paul and the Corinthians, he now says, are a part of that. Finally, verse 11. You also, Corinthians, joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of of many. Now, this is an interesting give and take that he's describing for us here. He's saying to them, your prayers have helped me and my suffering made it possible for your prayers to help me. <laughs> so, do you catch what he's doing there? If I hadn't suffered, then you wouldn't have had to pray and there wouldn't be all of this comfort and encouragement going back and forth. Guys, prayer changes things. Amen. God answers prayers. God, prayers are quite often the means that God uses to help others. And at some point, we, we can then maybe look forward to that thanks coming back from those we've been praying for. I think of people in my past. There was uh, years ago as a youth pastor, I wondered there was a season in my life, uh, quite a few, where I thought, wow, things are really going well. And I don't understand exactly why they're going so well because I'm not this good. Or, you know, I even through mistakes I made, things would happen. And then I happened to meet an older gal, probably in her 80s, that had uh, been one of the elder people in the first church I was serving in. And she told me that for the last 20 years, I have been praying for you daily, Willie. I was on her prayer list for 20 years, and then it all came into focus. Okay, now I know why some of those things are happening. When people tell me, I can't really serve, you know, that's, that's one of the requirements of membership. I can't really serve because I'm, I'm infirm or I'm, I'm sickly or whatever. Well, can you pray? You know, I mean, come and pray. That's, that's not just praying. That is a major thing. What one, one leader said, uh, prayer isn't half the battle. It is the battle. It's what God does. It's how he works. And uh, I, I should probably throw in a plug for our prayer time this afternoon at 5.30. From 5.30 to 6.30, we pray together in the conference room as we come boldly before the throne of God. I would hope that uh, you're using these cards. If you don't know what these are, grab one on your way out the doors this morning. As we are praying for the people in our worlds, we're, we first we pray and say, Lord, who are those people? And then start writing them down. We have places for you to write those names down. And then start praying for them daily that you would be able to have an impact in their life and then get ready as God will answer that prayer and will give you opportunities and look for, for chances to invite them to things and to build into their lives and to see them come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, as we've seen this morning, God's, uh, Paul's confidence in God was solid often because of the suffering that he endured. And he had his firm hope in the Corinthians and the prayers that they prayed for him was part of the deliverance that he experienced. Guys, we have a name for that here at Crosswinds. We call that grow and go. Grow in Christ through our study of his word, through our interactions with each other, and then go to the worlds that God has put us in. There was a teacher, a psychology class, and the professor one day held up a glass of water. And he asked his class... How heavy do you think this glass of water is? And the class started guessing, and they guessed anywhere from 8 ounces up to like 30 ounces. And he said to them, because this class happened to be on stress management, <laughs> and he said to them, well, you know, it doesn't really matter the exact weight of this glass. 
What really matters is how long I hold this glass up like this. He said, if I hold the glass up for about a minute, well, that's not so bad. It's, it's a pretty light glass. If I hold the glass up for an hour, all right, now it's getting quite a bit heavier and, and my arm's starting to hurt. If I hold the glass up for a day, you might actually have to call an ambulance for me. The guys, the thing is, the exact weight is not the issue. It's the longer that I hold it, the heavier it becomes. The weight of it eventually causes me to suffer. And I think of that when I think of the fact that we often try to carry our burdens by ourselves. And sooner or later, we suffer more and more and more because that burden becomes increasingly heavy as I try to carry it on my own. What you have to do is put it down once in a while and rest and, and recognize that we are here for each other, that we are here to encourage one another and share and, and refresh one another. And then we can pick it back up and, and carry it a little bit further. Guys, this is what God wants to do in you and through you. In the midst of your suffering, he wants to encourage you with your brothers and sisters. Or in the midst of others' suffering, he wants you to be an encourager for them as they carry their burdens and experience that uncomfortable comfort that comes from knowing him. Peter put it this way, don't be surprised, brothers, at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. <laughs> so in other words, trials aren't, aren't meant to be looked at as, as something unusual. But to the degree that you, what's that word? Share. share. To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Now, obviously, the context there is sharing the sufferings of Christ with Christ, but obviously, we are the body of Christ. So it is, I, I think I'm, I'm, it's fair for me to extrapolate from that that we share with each other. We don't go it alone. We're here for each other. Let me give you a couple of takeaways this morning. The first one would be, in light of the first section, am I really serving God or something else? Am I serving myself? Am I serving some people in my life, some, some uh, job or employer or whatever? Secondly, so who does, he want me, who does he want to encourage through me? And again, that's going to the fact that, okay, I'm going through this situation. God has a purpose, and quite often, as we've seen this morning, it is for the purpose of comforting others. There's nothing wrong with being on the lookout for that person. And then thirdly, what trial has become a good thing in my life? This is a kind of a precursor to a question in your small groups this week. I bet if you sit down and really think about it, maybe, maybe you'll actually realize, you know, that was a horrible experience, and yet God has done an amazing thing. Let me just tell you, if you haven't done that before, that can be a very encouraging thing in your life, because otherwise it just seems like you know, bad things happen and then you die. You know, <laughs> but instead it's bad things happen and God uses those bad things to further his kingdom. And boy, that is encouraging. That is comforting, if you will. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your word to us today. Lord, uh, I, I am I'm so glad I don't have your job. Father, I, I, I couldn't, no way could any of us put all of this together. And yet somehow, Lord, you work all these things out so that we all fit together. It's this, it's this fantastic puzzle uh, uh, called the Church of Jesus Christ where we are linked together and, and we, we come together and form this, this beautiful picture of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that that would be especially true here at Crosswinds Church, that we would care for one another, we would encourage one another with that encouragement that we have received through those difficulties that we've experienced. And that, Father, the world would see this and would sit up and take notice, recognizing that they don't take notice of our prosperity. They take notice when we're struggling and somehow get through it. And Father, this week, open our eyes to people in their situations and, and, and opportunities that we have to speak into their lives and to invite them to become a part of this mosaic that we're building here. 
Father, as we give our offerings right now, Lord, would you, as, we, as I already shared this morning, as the, the elders and, and other leaders, as we pray, Lord, for wisdom on how to best use the funds that we take in so that we get the, the maximum return on our investment uh, for your kingdom. Father, give us that wisdom. Bless those who are giving. And we thank you for this privilege this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here at Crosswinds, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over the world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page or you can go to cwcmv.org slash give. Join us and join what God is doing through this vision of growing and going. And have a great day.